Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight we'll, we'll be exploring some of the best of Europe's art. My name is Ben Green and I'll be your moderator as we travel with Rick. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our European art connoisseur, Rick Steves. Good evening, Rick. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for that good introduction. And I want to welcome all of you to really a very exciting episode of Monday Night Travel. As I've been teasing and talking about for months and months now, we've been working a long time on this sweep through European art history for travelers, art appreciation. It's the art of Europe. And right now, just yesterday, it debuted all over the United States. It's our six hour mini series on public television. And it's just been a love of mine for decades to help Americans better understand art, because I've really found the more you understand the art, the more fun it is. And today, what I thought I would do to celebrate the debut of our mini series is I went through all six hours and I pulled my, I guess you could say my favorite clips out of the six one hour shows and assembled them into a 60 minutes greatest hits of European art from the earliest cave paintings right up to the art of our generation. So we're going to share that tonight. And I just want to thank you for being with us. We've got a lot of video content tonight. Normally we have 30 or 40 minutes, but we've got an hour of video content tonight, and I'm just going to have a lot of fun watching it. I hope you will too. And I want to, I'll break in a few times and give you a few insights on a behind the scenes look, but basically we're going to get the best, my, my hunch at the best 10 minutes of each of the hours coming up. And we're going to start at the very beginning. So I'm going to roll it right now. And I just want to thank you again for joining us on Monday Night Travel. And we're going to start out with the sort of opening of the whole series. And then we have a little, uh, the show open. And it's the only thing we do here that is not um, uh, in-house in our TV production. We farm it out because it's a little more tech, high tech and, and fancy. And it's the 30 second, um, you know, visual wow uh, start that we do for each of our one hour specials. You'll see that. And then we're off and running from prehistoric times until today. So I've got my little glass of wine here and I've got some nice munchies and we'll enjoy that together later. But right now, let's go. And we're gonna start, I would say, well, at the very beginning. Hi, I'm Rick Steves here with the story of Europe's art from prehistory to the present. All my life, art has brought me great joy in my travels. And I've learned the more we understand art, the more we appreciate it. In this six hour series, we'll enrich your understanding and therefore your enjoyment of European art. There must be about 150 on cameras. And for me, the real exciting thing is to choose a nice, what we call a frame. There's a good frame for you. The, we were so thankful that the Acropolis there in Athens had no scaffolding on this end of it. The sun was right. My shirt even matches the beautiful sky. And this is a good way to kick it off. We had so much fun in Greece and it just was the beginning of a lot of art. Thanks for joining us. The story of Europe is shaped by its art, and its art is shaped by its story. In this six-part series, we'll track the exciting evolution of European art and architecture over the centuries. We'll venture from prehistoric cave paintings to the rise of great civilizations, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. After a thousand years of Middle Ages, with its great castles, soaring cathedrals, and radiant religious art, we'll see how the spirit of the ancient world was reborn in the Renaissance, which produced some of the world's greatest masterpieces. Tracing the rise of kings with their awe-inspiring palaces and dramatic art, we'll see how that old world was eventually toppled by revolution to be replaced with modern industry and the art of a prosperous belle epoch. 
and will finish by careening through Europe's tumultuous 20th century. With hard times, great times, and the art that helped tell the story. So the fun challenge for us was to break the series into six one-hour chunks. And how do you do that? Where should you cut it off and so on? This first hour, we're going to see seven or eight minutes of it, was from prehistoric, like Stonehenge and cave paintings, all the way up to ancient Greece. The next hour would be Rome, but that's not in the first hour. So we're going to start way, way back. Roughly 8,000 years ago, across Europe, the last part of the Stone Age was marked by tribes settling down shifting from hunter-gatherers to farmers. This was the Late Stone Age, also called the Neolithic Age, still before the advent of metalworking. On the Isle of Orkney, at the far north of Scotland, in what seems like just another field, is a remarkable burial mound, or chambered tomb. For 5,000 years, people have lowered their heads to enter this sacred space. This is great. Tell me about this place. This is a burial chamber. And to our right and our left and behind you are three tombs. Mm -hmm. On winter solstice at sunset, the sun streams through this position here and illuminates the back chamber. The stone is sandstone and it's been hand carved and corbelled, vaulted into position to make this beautiful chamber. And how Neolithic man managed to build this structure, no one really knows. By 500 BC, Athens was becoming the bustling center of a growing Greek-speaking world. The energetic Athenians built up their sacred hill, the Acropolis, turning it into the heart of their culture. They topped the Acropolis with glorious temples, statues, and monuments honoring the gods and celebrating their own achievements. This temple was famed for its caryatids, beautiful maidens functioning as columns, striking for their realism and relaxed poses. But the greatest temple was the Parthenon, dedicated to Athena, the patron of Athens. In its heyday, the temple was decorated with colorful painted sculpture. And inside stood a 40-foot tall golden ivory statue. This is a reproduction of the goddess Athena. Dazzling in both beauty and power, both the statue and the temple had a huge impact on people. The temple is massive, 230 feet long and 100 feet wide, made from the finest white marble and assembled here like a 70,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Its 34-foot tall columns are simple yet elegant. The architects used clever, if subtle, optical illusions that added to the harmonious effect. The steps intentionally arc upward in the middle to compensate for how a flat line appears to sag. The columns lean together just slightly and bulge in the middle as if absorbing the weight of the stone roof. Altogether, it's organic. Rather than static stone, it feels alive with perfect proportions, as if heroically connecting with the gods. Subconsciously, it works. A 2,500-year-old architectural triumph. These columns, knocked over in an earthquake, illustrate how Greek columns were made not from a single piece, but from stacks of stone drums held together with a peg in the center and capped with a capital. Once the drums were stacked, the grooves were carved. That's called fluting. And then a layer of plaster was added to make it look like marble. Finally, the temple's decorative features were painted with bold colors. By the way, the style of temples evolved over time and can be identified by the capitals. The capitals, or tops of the columns, were both functional to minimize the distance the lintel needed to span and decorative. While just the tip of the architectural iceberg the capitals are handy indicators, helping us identify the three main architectural orders or styles. The earliest style, Doric, has flat practical plates as capitals. In the next order, Ionic, the capitals are decorated with understated scrolls. The final order, Corinthian, 
features leafy capitals, boldly decorative, with no apologies necessary. How to remember all of these? As the orders evolve, they gain syllables. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. Whatever the order, Greek temples, with their ingenious engineering and perfect proportions, are stone symbols of how the rational Greeks were conquering chaos and ushering in a golden age led by Athens. So I would say out of the six hours that you're going to see in this series, half of it was drawn from shots we had done before in the last, oh, many years as we've produced the show. Uh, as for the last 10 years, I've been shooting the regular show with this art series in mind so we can collect great footage from all the wonderful cultural you know, highlights of Europe. And about half of the footage was footage that we shot on purpose for this show. We spent, oh, um, well, three different trips uh, and lots of time all over Europe uh, shooting the footage you're seeing as it all comes together here. And for me as a tour guide and an art enthusiast, it was just really fun to be able to you know, teach the little terms I like uh, and some examples, you know, spanned by a lintel, capped by a capital, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, as they get fancier, they get more syllables. Uh, plenty of ways to teach art history in a fun way. Coming up is a chance to demonstrate the amazing acoustics in those ancient theaters that still all over the Mediterranean world are used to host concerts today. The Golden Age, roughly around 450 BC, was the peak of Greek civilization. It was the age of Socrates and Plato, of democracy, philosophy, and a flowering of the arts, including drama and performance arts. Every city had a theater. Performance arts were woven into society. Going to a play was like going to church. It was where morals were taught. Greeks generally built their theaters into hillsides. Given their size, often with over 10,000 seats, and the obvious lack of modern amplification, the acoustics needed to be excellent. And they still are. Friends, Greeks, wayfarers, in these times of discord, fear is rampant in our society. I contend that the flip side of fear is understanding. And those who travel will reap great understanding by meeting people who find other truths to be self-evident and God-given. Ancient Rome lasted a thousand years, from 500 BC to 500 AD. It grew for 500 years, peaked for 200, and fell for 300 years. Actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. But ancient Romans, with their vast empire, gave Europe its first taste of a common culture and left an enduring legacy of great art. We'll start with Rome's legendary beginnings and then see how it rose to conquer its neighbors and win them over with engineering smarter and mightier than the world had ever seen. At its peak, Rome enjoyed unprecedented luxury, huge arenas for entertaining the masses, monuments to egotistical emperors, and temples with glorious domes all with a fine eye for beauty. We'll see how the pragmatic Romans came to embrace both Greek gods and the Christian one. Finally, we'll watch as the glorious empire fell, leaving a foundation for the rise of today's Europe. So that's the montage in the open for the second hour, which is ancient Rome, as I explained, a thousand years from 500 BC to 500 AD. And um, in, in, the, in the next little bit, we're going to go to the Pantheon. And you'll see a little indication on the screen that if you want the locations and the names of the art that's featured in the show, you can go to our website and see the script. And embedded in the script, you've got all of the locations and the information you need to take these ideas and incorporate them into your travel plans. When we were writing this script, we decided not to clutter up the, the verbiage, what I was saying, with a lot of needless names and dates. But you should know the names and dates and where these things are. So that's available written into the script when you go to ricksteves.com in the TV section. So let's go now to the Pantheon. The Romans realized you can't build really big with Greek-style marbles, columns, and beams. So they invented or perfected the round arch, domes, and the use of concrete, brick, and mortar. 
and they put it all together with brilliant engineering. A fine example of that is the magnificent Pantheon, the best preserved building surviving from ancient Rome. The portico, with its stately pediment, shows their Greek-inspired sophistication. But behind that is more no-nonsense Roman engineering. The columns are one single piece of granite, quarried in Egypt and shipped to Rome. They're massive. It takes four tourists to hug one. Stepping inside, you enjoy the finest look anywhere at the artistic splendor of ancient Rome. The colored marble, the mathematical perfection. Its dimensions are classic, based on a perfect circle, as wide as it is tall, 142 feet. Just add incense and togas, and you're there. The dome the biggest ever built until then is made of poured concrete. It gets thinner and lighter with height. The highest part is actually made with pumice, an airy volcanic stone. Pantheon. It means all gods. With 12 altars, it was where the many gods of the empire were worshipped. And the oculus, along with the door, the temple's only source of light, still seems to connect us mortals with the heavens. The Pantheon which survived so well because it's been in continuous use for nearly 2,000 years, first as a pagan temple and then as a Christian church, has inspired architects to this day. While centuries earlier, the Greeks idealized with each goddess a classic beauty, the Romans added their own characteristic twist, realism more down-to-earth, showing an intimate side of everyday Roman life. They decorated their homes with often whimsical statues and fountains. This statue captures a peaceful moment as a boy patiently pulls a thorn from his foot. And this tipsy fawn is a playful reminder of a Roman trait that survives to this day their fondness for good food and fine wine. Besides noble gods, they sculpted real people from all aspects of Roman life, no longer so idealized, but realistically. Wow, okay, so now imagine carving all of these great statues out of a block of marble. And of course, it's throughout art history. Uh, great sculptors have been chiseling away on this. How did they do it? We wanted to show that. So as we were producing the show, we visited a number of amazing artists. We got a mosaic workshop. We got oil painting as opposed to tempera painting. We got engraving. And we've got a sculptor demonstrating sculpting. And believe it or not, the same techniques the ancient Roman used are what they're using today. So we organized this. Uh, it was kind of expensive, but we hired a, a well-known sculptor in Florence to let us uh, be there while he was working. And uh, as we go into this next bit, just imagine the fun it is to produce this. You have to, you drop in, you, you meet the sculptor, uh, you review your plan, you got to communicate exactly what you not, what you need, you think about your script, then the cameraman is going away and shooting everything, and he's editing. Carl is just editing in his mind as he's shooting. We bring it home, post-produce it, Steve Camerano edits it all together and puts in gorgeous music. Go with me now to a studio in Florence. And again, if you wonder where that studio is, it's not written in the show, but you can find that when you go to the website and you find the TV script and you see the details there. But now we're in Florence at an amazing sculptor's studio. By the way, whether in ancient times or in modern times, sculpting with marble is essentially the same process. The sculptor generally starts with a clay model. Making this is the creative work of the artist. Once this is finished, it's copied. An artisan can take it from there. From the clay model, a plaster cast is made. And then, with a pointing machine, corresponding points are copied. The sculptor starts with a raw piece of marble, chipping at first with a big chisel, then various finer chisels then a rasp. 
and finally polished with sandpaper, creating the same timeless beauty as the ancients. This church captures the last chapter of Roman glory. Its sanctuary, an oasis of order, was meant to assure everyone that, despite the chaos around them, all was right with the world. Its familiar Roman mosaics, countless vibrantly colored cubes the size of your fingernail, give the church an ethereal glow. Christ is calmly in charge, overseeing the peaceful world below. And running things here on earth is his partner, the last emperor to rule a united Rome, Justinian. Sporting both a halo and a crown, he unites both church and state, supported by bishops and generals, who, with steady gazes, radiate a sense of stability. Facing the emperor is his powerful wife, Theodora, and her elegant entourage. The former dancer, who became his mistress, then empress, is decked out in rich jewels and pearls and carries a chalice to consecrate the new church. The art here is propaganda, a celebration of the Roman world. Everything is in good order. The ancient portrayal of Christ symbolizes perfection. The stylized cross is flanked by two angels declaring victory. The ceiling is a festival of God's creation with nearly a hundred different birds, most still flying around this part of Italy. And everything swirls around a sacrificial lamb, which symbolizes Christ, supported by four angels. Notice how this Christ is beardless, the style of the ancient Romans. Well, just steps away, this bearded Christ is the standard medieval portrayal of Jesus. These are some of the last artworks of ancient Rome, and the first of medieval works to come, bridging the ancient and medieval worlds. With its harmonious atmosphere, it's a poignant reminder of the peace and stability of a Roman order that was coming to an end. Wow, I just got to say, it is so fun to revisit this amazing art. I do want to remind you, it's part of our ethic. We never shoot anything that you can't see yourself. So all of this stuff is just a matter of organizing your sightseeing and uh, checking it out yourself. You know, I'm just one very happy tour guide right now because all over the country, I get to share my love of this art and also my quirky little favorite tips, my favorite little points. I mean, I never knew until I traveled that the Romans portrayed Jesus without a beard. And then the Jesus that we normally have on our paintings and stuff is a bearded character. And right there, we saw the cusp between ancient and medieval times, the year 500. So we have gone now about 20,000 years. We've only got 1500 to go, but we're really just getting started. Uh, let me just kind of, um, uh, give you a, a quick quick sweep now how from a chronology point of view the six hours break out uh the first show that we saw goes way back to the very beginnings 10 or twenty thousand years bc up to the end of greece or the beginning of rome let's and then the next one goes from 500 bc to 580 that's what we just saw ancient rome the next hour that we're going to see just in a moment here in seven minutes is uh from another thousand years from 500 to 1500 the fourth hour would be 200 years, about 1400 to 1600. That would be the Renaissance. The next show is the Baroque Age and the flip side of that uh, neoclassical from about 1600 to 1850. And the sixth and final hour is the Modern Age, starting in about 1850 and going up to today. So that's the sweep. And we're just getting a little tease from each show. We've seen two hours now. In fact, we're going to have a little flash poll at the end of our um, viewing here and ask you to, to, to vote on which of these eras, which of these hours would you most like to see the whole hour right now? I'm just curious which ones are picking your curiosity. But right now, we got six minutes to cover a thousand years of the Middle Ages. Let's go. The Middle Ages spanned a thousand years, from about 500 to 1500. The first half was a time of relative poverty and economic stagnation. Then, around the year 1000, Europe rebounded. That story, its turmoil and triumphs, is reflected in the magnificent art and architecture of the age. 
We start after the fall of Rome, as the flickering flame of civilization was kept alive in monasteries and in fortress-like churches. We'll see how Europe was invigorated by neighbors on the fringes, from Christian Byzantium to Islamic Spain to the pagan Vikings of the north. Then we step into the High Middle Ages, marveling at formidable castles, radiant Gothic cathedrals, and art that both dazzled the faithful and celebrated secular life, as Europeans approached the dawn of a new age. By the year 1000, Europe was on the rise. Entering a period called the High Middle Ages, it was a time of growing innovation, trade, and travel. Christianity was dominant, and people celebrated their faith by building great structures. The imposing Romanesque style was eventually eclipsed by an even grander style, Gothic. Gothic was an architectural leap forward, with taller and taller churches reaching for the heavens and filled with more and more light. Fueled by their faith, Europeans built towering cathedrals to the glory of God. Each community tried to outdo the other, with churches featuring soaring naves, supported by elaborate pointed arches and flooded with light. Gothic seemed to be emblematic of a Europe moving upward and onward. The Gothic style was born in France in the 12th century. The cathedral in Chartres, one of the first, greatest, and most influential Gothic churches, captures the spirit of this Age of Faith, as the Middle Ages were nicknamed. Magnificent structures were built by the sweat of peasants, construction projects that dominated entire communities for generations, all for the glory of God. Towering churches like this became sites which, for centuries, broke distant horizons, heartening the weary spirits of approaching pilgrims. So now we're going to demonstrate how to build a Gothic cathedral. And, uh, you know, for me, the again, the fun challenge was finding good places to do these on cameras where I stand and talk to the camera. And this is a place I'd never been to before until we needed a lot of good angles for the camera. This is a, the, one of the most beautiful Gothic cathedrals anywhere in France. It's Amiens, A-M-I-E-N-S. And it doesn't have much going for it other than this amazing cathedral. So a lot of people don't go there, but it's just a couple hours from Paris. And we were so thankful to have gone there. Now, when we are looking at all of this art in Europe, it's important to understand what you're looking at. And that's one thing we're trying to make really clear in this series and in everything we produce. The more you understand what you're looking at, the more fun it'll be. And when it comes to Gothic cathedrals, you're going to spend a lot of time in Gothic cathedrals, whether you really want to or not. They're free, they're open, it might be raining, it's on the main square, left step inside. And for years, I would do that, and I would just look inside, and I'd go, man, this is big, and it's old. Oh, nothing this old in my town. Uh, then I learned a little more about Gothic, and it made so much of a difference. A fun little tour guide trick that we like to do on our tours, I, I just love to do this, is to build a Gothic cathedral out of 13 tourists. Just last, uh, when was it? It was just last fall. I was in Europe with a bunch of our new guides on a mentor tour. I'm gonna to be doing that again in just a, a month or so with um, having a 20 or 25 uh, of our newer guides on the tour. They're all professional guides, but they're learning how to be Rick Steves guides to do a Rick Steves style tour, which is not just any tour. And I like to go with them in person so we can actually travel together and share our enthusiasm for respecting art, finding fun and creative ways to teach art and giving people memorable experiences. So right now you're gonna see me as the guide and a bunch of our guides as the tourists build a Gothic cathedral with 13 human beings. Check this out. Gothic churches were taller and brighter than the earlier Romanesque. They were made with a skeleton of support. The key to Gothic is the pointed arch. A Romanesque church is built with round arches. With a round arch, the weight pushes down. But with a pointed arch, the weight pushes not down, but out. As a tour guide, it's fun to demonstrate this by building a Gothic cathedral out of tourists. You start with six columns. These will support the roof with ribs, ignore the elbows, coming together with pointed arches. The 
key to Gothic is the pointed arch. A Romanesque church is built with round arches. With a round arch, the weight sits squarely on the wall, and it needs to be thick and strong. If a round arch collapses, it falls down. But if you point the arches, suddenly the weight of the roof pushes not down, but out. So rather than thick walls, you need to buttress the building by adding support pushing in. So you need six more tourists to be buttresses. With buttresses rather than thick walls supporting the church, the walls are freed to become window holders, letting in more light. To free up even more wall space, you can make the buttresses flying buttresses with their support flying in with more arches. Are you guys ready for a spire? Yes, yes. we are. Now, when the spire is raised, because of the pointed arches, the weight goes out rather than down. And with buttresses in place, everything is solid. Windows can fill the spaces between the columns, and you've built a Gothic church out of tourists. Yep. These huge caverns of stone needed to be decorated, and they were filled with the most glorious art of the Gothic world towering altarpieces, inspiring statues, and the triumph of Gothic, exquisite stained glass. Sainte-Chapelle in Paris is a fine example. In typical Gothic style, the church is a skeleton of support, with buttressed columns, ribs, and pointed arches supporting the stone roof and freeing the walls to be window frames. In this case, to hold Europe's best original 13th century glass. In the Bible, it's clear, light is divine. And with Gothic, light pours through stained glass, turning dark stone buildings into colorful lanterns of light. Chart Cathedral is beloved for both its stained glass and statues, which together weave a unified Christian story. In the Book of Chart, as some nicknamed the church, the text is the sculpture and windows, and its binding is the architecture. The nave is vast, lit by magnificent 800-year-old stained glass. The light pouring through these windows was mystical and encouraged meditation and prayer. The stained glass was used to help teach Bible stories to the illiterate faithful, and it gave worshipers images to focus on as they prayed. Windows can be read from bottom to top, as if from earth to heaven. The brilliant color is from minerals mixed into the glass as it's made, such as cobalt for the dazzling blue. The windows lead the reader through a series of dramatic scenes. For example, the Last Supper, Jesus washing his disciples' feet, his betrayal with the kiss of Judas, and the crucifixion. The amazing thing in the 21st century, Chart is perfectly intact and can be read like a book today as it was eight centuries ago. In England, the York Minster brilliantly shows that the late Middle Ages were far from dark. This window's the size of a tennis court. The intricacy of the stone framing or tracery and how the tiny panes of glass are held together by lead is exquisite. The fine details, far too tiny to see from the floor, are said to be for God's eyes only. are said to be for God's eyes only. I just love that phrase. And when you travel, you do, you are able now as a 21st century tourist to climb to spots that were made 800 years ago that were not open to the public. Nobody would ever be seeing that. And it was still lovingly crafted, just beautiful. And you find that all over the place. It's so exciting to be able to go there in person and check it out. I'd like to take a moment right now to just say, I'm thankful for public broadcasting. This is not even a pledge drive. I just, I'm so aware of the importance of media in our society and uh, how media shapes our worldview, how media inspires us to be engaged and to reach out and how media uh, primes our younger generation to be good citizens and contribute. You know, 
there's one place on the media dial that respects our intelligence, that assumes an a detention span, and we need an attention span to get our brain around a lot of these concepts, and a place that is driven not by a passion for keeping advertisers happy, but driven by a passion for helping all of us get out there and reach out and celebrate the world in all its beauty and all its diversity. That's public broadcasting. And uh, my show would never see the light of day anywhere else. I can promise you that. And if you appreciate this, you just got to remember, this is just one little slice of what is produced in that beautiful oasis in our media corner called, in our media environment called public broadcasting. And while I'm thanking public broadcasting, I'd like to thank our crew. We have the smallest crew in the game. It's basically, there's just a handful of us. Uh, my co-author, Gene Openshaw, he's been my buddy and, and partner in tour guiding crime for 40 years. Uh, uh, Gene uh, was uh, the spearhead of the writing of this script. Uh, Simon Griffith is our producer. Uh, Simon and I have worked together now for, I don't know, 20 or 25 years, more than 20, 20 years, yeah, maybe 30 years, geez. And every show I've ever done that you've seen right here has been produced by Simon. Simon is with us in Europe every inch of the way, and then he shepherds the whole process through once we get home. Uh, we've got several car uh, camera people, but our um, number one car cameraman is Carl Bauer, and he shot most of what you're seeing today. And of course, when it's all brought home, we need the artistry of our editor, and that is Steve Camerano. And just Steve, we all just are so thankful because we work so hard in the field. And when we come home, if it wasn't put together so beautifully by Steve Camerano, uh, it would not be as gratifying as it is. So I'm just so excited about this six hours of content now that's starting to air all over the United States. It's airing in Seattle uh, tonight uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, every Monday for the next six weeks. And then it's airing on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for the next six weeks. And I imagine it'll be aired again and again. All over the country, every city's picking this up. So if you'd like to watch the whole series, we're just giving you a little tease tonight. Check out your local public television schedule. Also, it's exciting to be able to meet with all of our traveling friends right here on Monday Night Travel. This is a, a, a a Monday night. It's a, it's a weekly celebration. It's a free party, and we're just thankful you're here, uh, and we couldn't do it without our team. We've got Ben, who's our moderator, and welcome back from Russia, Ben. Uh, just a, a week or two ago, Ben gave an amazing report on his experience studying in Russia and then having to leave because of current events there and finishing off his foreign year abroad, his study year abroad in, Hel in um, Helsinki in Finland and travels in the Baltics and so on. Great uh, uh, opportunity to hear Ben's report. And that's a reminder that every show we've ever done is archived here in Monday Night Travel. So you could just go to our website and page through what we've produced in the last three years and click on whatever is interesting for you. Uh, we've also got uh, Julianne, who's answering your questions right now, and Gabe and Lisa. Lisa happens to be in Europe because most of our staff goes to Europe quite a bit. But we're just thankful for our crew to make the show, and we're happy, happy for our crew to make Monday Night Travel. I want to remind you, you can watch the entire series as it comes out. Only the first hour is available at this time, but every week now, new episodes will come out. Uh, and we'll be streaming, we'll have them available for free on our website. And of course, you can get them at Passport uh, Streaming on Public Television. Uh, what we do every every week on Monday Night Travel is we have Q&A time. Julianne is organizing your questions right now. If you have any questions, we'll have plenty of time for that. And just uh, type them in, in the Q&A section there. And our team puts together important links uh, dealing with the content of every week's Monday Night Travel episode. And those are right there in the chat section. So take a look at that if you want to know what is available to click through and uh, follow up on for information. We try to support the information that we have here. Of fertility, as a nymph escapes the cold west wind, she sprouts flowers from her lips and transforms into the goddess of spring, who spreads blossoms from her dress. The three graces do a delicate dance. While a blindfolded Cupid happily shoots arrows of love without worrying who they'll hit. In the center stands Venus, the goddess of love, framed by a halo of leaves as she presides over a delightful scene of beauty, joy, and love. The epitome of early Renaissance beauty may be Botticelli's Birth of Venus, the first large-scale depiction of a naked woman in a thousand years. Born from the foam of a wave, Venus is just waking up. The world itself seems fresh and newly born. The god of the wind sets the whole scene in motion. 
Floating ashore on her scallop shell, Venus takes center stage. Botticelli creates an ideal world, perfectly lit. The bodies curve harmoniously. The faces are idealized. And their gestures exude grace. Mm. Naked as a newborn, Venus symbolized the optimism of the Renaissance. Next, Michelangelo took on the epic scale statue of David, displayed today as if the high altar in a temple to humanism. The young shepherd who slew the giant turned down the armor of the day, arming himself only with stones. He throws his sling over his shoulder and goes out to face the giant. Michelangelo catches David at the exact moment when he's sizing up the enemy and thinks to himself, I can take this guy. This statue has come to symbolize that with the Renaissance, humankind could slay the giant of medieval ignorance and superstition. David's oversized right hand was no accident. It represented how this shepherd boy, empowered by God, could slay the giant and how Florence could rise above its rival city-states. When you look at David, you're looking at Renaissance man. Artists now made their point using realism. They did this by merging art and science. For instance, Michelangelo actually dissected human corpses to better understand anatomy. This humanism was not anti-religion. Now people realize that the best way to glorify God was not to bow down in church all day long, but to recognize their talents and to use them. The artistic influences from Spain's vast empire came together in Toledo with its greatest and last Renaissance painter. His name was Dominicus Theotokopoulos, though his tongue-tied friends just called him the Greek, or El Greco. Artistically, he's hard to classify. El Greco's work reflects his strong faith and his much-traveled life. It's a synthesis of three cultures, the icon-like faces of his Greek Orthodox homeland, the bold color and twisting poses from his schooling in Venice, and the mystical Catholicism of Spain, where he eventually settled in the city of Toledo, then Spain's capital. It's there that El Greco forged his unique style. El Greco painted supernatural visions, Elongated saints stretched between earth and heaven. He painted souls, not bodies. Faces flicker like candles. Thoroughly modern in its disregard for realism, El Greco's art feels contemporary even today. This altarpiece, depicting the Ascension of Mary, combines El Greco's signature elements to capture an otherworldly event. While on earth the city of Toledo sleeps, an angel in a billowing robe spreads its wings and flies up, supporting the Virgin Mary on her trip to heaven. In this divine vision, she floats through warped space to be serenaded by angels and wrapped in the radiant light of the Holy Spirit. Mary is charged from within by the <clears throat> ecstasy of her faith. No painter captured the mystery of the spiritual world quite like El Greco. He fused innovative techniques with Spanish religiosity to cap the Renaissance of Golden Age Spain. So it was really interesting to start in Italy as the Renaissance did, go to, go to Portugal, go to Spain, go to the Low Countries, and go to Germany. The Renaissance spread all through Europe. Now we're going to go to meet Albrecht Dürer in Nuremberg. In painting, Germany's Renaissance master was Albrecht Dürer. He traveled to Italy and brought home Italy's embrace of realism, humanism, and respect for artists as cultural leaders of the day. Bold and dynamic and quirky, Dürer had no problem with his ego. He painted himself almost as the Christ of his day, celebrating his genius and his great head of hair. His proud monogram marks nearly all his art. Dürer was more than a painter. As a master engraver, <clears throat> he created prints made from finely crafted metal plates. His trademark detail and realism is extraordinary. 
At his workshop, you can see how it's with these tools that the artist cuts an image into the copper plate. After rubbing it with ink, a print is made from the plate. Durer was famous for his vivid portrayals of the natural world. To be able to enjoy such beautiful, yet mass-produced art must have been a marvel 500 years ago. Durer was the first best-selling artist in history. Thanks to this impressive new technology, many prints could be made from a single master plate. Durer's engravings were affordable and spread across Europe, further accelerating the rapid spread of new art and new ideas. 500 years ago, one Flemish painter, Hieronymus Bosch, took... That's the oldest shot of me in the series. That was, goes way back to 2004. We filmed in the Prada where this is just a year ago, but they wouldn't let, they wouldn't let us do anything but five paintings. <laughs> and we only had one hour. It was the most frustrating thing, but we were thankful to get there. So we drew from some old footage here, but of course the Garden of Delights has not changed. As we check out this amazing painting by Hieronymus Bosch, I want you to listen to the music and imagine trying to make a, a series like this without the music. And we have this, it's a menacing painting and we have this menacing bass line and this rhythm that goes right through the whole description here. And it finishes right on Bosch. And that is the brilliance of Steve Camerano, our editor. The Northern Renaissance in a direction that seems radical even today. His Garden of Earthly Delights, a three-paneled altarpiece, or triptych, shows the delights of the world and where those temptations lead. In Act One, man and woman are born innocent in the Garden of Eden, blessed by a kind God. But then, foolish people chase after earthly delights, a pursuit that is ultimately a vicious cycle. They're lured by the world's pleasures, eating, Drinking, sex, like the fleeting flavor of that fruit, strawberries everywhere symbolize how the delights of hedonism are soon gone. Two lovers are suspended in a bubble. Then in the third panel, the bubble pops. The moral of the story, those party animals are heading straight to hell a burning post-apocalyptic wasteland where sinners are led off to eternal torment. Every sinner gets an appropriate punishment. Gluttons are themselves consumed over and over. Good time musicians are tortured by their own instruments. Gamblers have their party forever crashed. And a lecher gets sexually harassed by a pig-faced nun. Amid it all, a face peers out of this bizarre nightmare a self-portrait of the artist, Bosch. Bosch. I love self-portraits. I don't know what it is, but you can psychoanalyze the genius of the time by his self-portrait. And every chance we had, we'd grab a self-portrait and work it into the script. But there is our man, Bosch, 500 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Now we're going to the Baroque hour. We got two more hours to go in our sweep through the story of Europe. And I mentioned we went to Europe uh, three times for the shoot and we filmed in the cities that are most important for European art. And it just was kind of obvious and it was really, really productive. The first shoot we did Venice. No, we did Florence, Rome and Athens. The next shoot we did London and Paris with side trips out to Stonehenge country and into the medieval French countryside. And in the most recent script, we shoot we did Bruges, Madrid, and Vienna. Now we're going to go to Baroque. For two centuries, roughly 1600 to 1800, Europe's rulers held on to the old medieval order, while new ideas bubbled beneath the surface. These tensions, conservative versus progressive, would produce astonishing art, from deeply religious to boldly secular, from patriotic to playful, from Baroque to neoclassical. For some historic background, we'll start with the religious struggles that eventually split Europe into two camps, each with its own distinct culture. 
the exuberant mm -hmm. art of Catholic elites, and the sober art of Protestant merchants. We'll see how France, with its divine right kings and their art, emerged as the center of European culture, and how excessive royal decadence led to violent revolution. And finally, how a dashing general would set Europe on a bold course toward the future. This was the last day of a multi-year shoot. We're in Vienna, in the Schönbrunn Palace. So great to be all alone in the Schönbrunn Palace, impressed by how art and history are just woven together. And today, we're able to share it with all of you. So now we will get into Baroque in a textbook Baroque palace, the Palace of the Habsburgs in Vienna, Schönbrunn. The art and architecture of this age was also a powerful political tool. The kings and queens of the day claimed they were ordained by God to rule without question. These so-called divine monarchs used art as propaganda to convince their subjects that their authority was legit. This magnificent German palace in Würzburg was home to the so-called Prince Bishop. He was a ruler with both secular and religious power. It was built in the Baroque style and decorated in the even frillier Rococo style that followed. As VIP guests arrived, they'd glide gracefully up the stairway, inspired by a grand fresco as it opened up overhead. The Prince Bishop was the center of the cosmos, honored by the Greek gods and ruler of the four great continents, including a bare-chested figure of America seated on an alligator at a rowdy cannibal barbecue. And Lady Europe points her brush to the center of all culture, the capital of his realm, Würzburg. <laughs> Palaces of this age feature grandiose architecture with decoration that abhors a straight line and is full of motion. Artists used mirrors and lavish gilding to enliven interiors. They were masters of three-dimensional illusion, using all the tricks from painting mathematically correct architecture to fake shadows, all to give a believable sense of 3D reality. Again, art of this period was pure marketing, paid for and serving either the church or the state, or in the Prince Bishop's case, both. Here, the bishop is being blessed by the imperial scepter, reminding all that he was part of a divinely ordained and secular chain of command. Bernini's Apollo and Daphne is quintessential Baroque in how it captures a dramatic moment. Apollo, happily wounded by Cupid's arrow, chases Daphne, who's saved by turning into a tree. Bernini captures the instant when, just as Apollo's about to catch Daphne, her fingers turn to leaves. Her toes sprout roots, and Apollo is in for one rude surprise. The statue, as much air as stone, makes a supernatural event seem real. This pre-Christian scene, while plenty fleshy, comes with a church-pleasing moral. Chasing earthly pleasures leads only to pain and frustration. Hmm. By the way, to appreciate the boldness of Bernini's Baroque style, compare his version of David with hmm. Michelangelo's Renaissance David from a century earlier. Michelangelo's is poised, balanced, and thoughtful perfect for the cerebral Renaissance era. Bernini's, on the other hand, is a Baroque action figure, his whole body wound like a spring as he prepares to slay the giant, showing the energy of the age. Bernini was a brash young man of 25 when he sculpted this, and the determined face of David is his own. I gotta say, it's so fun to psychoanalyze the art through the ages and then compare it. I don't believe we have time in tonight's little montage of highlights from the series. I had to be very, very select to fit six hours into one hour. I had to be very select to fit 2,000 years into six hours, I'll tell you that. But uh, one on camera that I did do, which you'll see when you look at the show in its entirety, is how art, as it goes through the ages, swings like a pendulum from cerebral to emotional, to cerebral and emotional. 
You've got the emotional Gothic age, the age of faith. Then you've got the cerebral Renaissance age. And after that, the uh, creativity of people's emotions wanted to get off the leash. And it was the Baroque age. And when that went too far, they cut off the head of the king and the queen. And they got back into the neoclassical age, the age of revolution, where everything was subjected to the test of reason. And then after too much of that, people who wanted to be creative and lose themselves in the wonder of nature and be dramatic, they had the Romantic Age. And you see that in the art, that wonderful pendulum, and we got to show it there, and we just saw some of the emotional art of Bernini and the Baroque Age. In the same generation, farther north here in Belgium, the most prolific and influential Baroque painter was Peter Paul Rubens, a favorite of Europe's wealthy, Rubens painted extravagant scenes with a dynamism that has come to define the Baroque style. Well-traveled, cultured, and confident, Rubens exemplified the exuberance of the age. Running his studio like a factory, he cranked out a steady stream of high-energy canvases. He'd start with a rough sketch, and he'd give that to his assistants in the studio, and they would paint the massive canvas when it was just about done. Rubens would come back in and give it what they called the fury of the brush. A little twinkle in the eye, a little glimmer there, a little light there. When he was satisfied, another Rubens masterpiece was shipped off to his wealthy patrons. Rubens painted anything that would raise your pulse. Battles. Miracles. Hunts and especially fleshy Rubenesque women with dimples on all four cheeks. Expert at composition, Rubens could arrange a teeming tangle of many figures into a harmonious ensemble. In this Greek myth, when lecherous half-human satyrs crash a party of nymphs, the action unfolds as satyrs chase and women flee. It's a horrible crescendo of violence a cresting wave of flailing limbs and chaotic figures that threatens to crash over the poor nymphs. Until the fierce goddess Diana, the huntress, plants her feet and makes a brave stand. She makes a brave stand. You know, looking at this Rubens, it reminds me nudity. It's a big challenge when you're making a TV show because in some markets in the United States, they are not comfortable showing the nude body. In fact, the network literally has to hire lawyers to flag our show and list how much nudity there is. Uh, you know, a marble penis carved 500 years ago, uh, a statue of a naked mythological figure carved or painted 600 years ago. Um, and we've got kind of, I got to be honest, a little crusade. We want to help Americans realize there's nothing dirty about the human body. I mean, in a, as a travel teacher and a tour guide, I'm really tuned into the idea that Culture shock is a good thing. Uh, culture shock is the growing pains of a broadening perspective. It's constructive. A lot of people, believe it or not, try to avoid culture shock. They want to leave home and travel and come home without being changed. I love coming home with a broader perspective. So there's culture shock. And I guess there's something you could, you could probably call biology shock. You know, a nude body. Well, artists through the ages have shown nude bodies because that makes it both timeless and universal. It gives their art more punch. And that's what we see in a lot of these paintings. So I just want to warn you, if you live in certain markets, you won't see my uh, travel shows, especially my art shows, until after bedtime. This next little bit is something I've long wanted to do. As some of you know, I used to be a piano teacher before I was a travel teacher. I love to demonstrate things on the piano. And I wanted to show, to make it really clear, how as art goes through the ages, all the different genres, all the different kinds of art hold hands. And if you want to let your ears have a little sightseeing, you got to remember the Baroque composers, Scarlatti, Handel, and Bach were all born in the same year, 1685. They were all right in tune with the Baroque painters and sculptors. I mean, Bach is like Bernini for your ears. So in Florence, I looked for a piano. And thankfully, we've got tours that go to Florence and any place our tours stay, they're a friend of ours. And I went to a hotel that had a piano and they weren't using it much as a piano. It was covered with liquor bottles and in their bar. So we moved that all out. We rearranged it. And they let me play my little bit on the piano. 
the piano was so out of tune that when we got home, Simon and I had to replay it on my piano here. And Simon just made the audio, believe it or not, with just a little iPhone um, uh, recording. And then Steve had to put my re-recording of the sound on top of the visuals of my fingers. So you're going to see my fingers moving in Florence, but the sound is looped in. I'll be honest with you here. It's faked. It's from a much nicer piano that's actually in tune. So it both looks good and sounds good. See if you can see any, any indication that I'm not really playing live on this very piano. Check it out. To save the day. By the way, the music of this period, Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, they all lived at the same time. It's like Bernini for your ears. We've been talking about the visual arts, but I like to remember that all the arts, and that includes music, are in sync. They hold hands as they walk through the ages. In terms of Baroque music, you're likely to hear two melodies dancing together, like this Bach invention. And another feature of Baroque is ornamentation. And in music, that means trills. Check out this Scarlatti. Boy, if you're going to play Baroque music, it's good to have ruffles on your sleeves. The Baroque style dominated much of Europe throughout this age. Whether it was found in the highly ornamented music of the day, its grandiose churches, over-the-top palaces, dramatic statues, or bubbling fountains. Baroque art was designed to have an emotional impact. And it still does. Of all the divine right kings, one was the greatest. And of all of the palaces, one was the grandest. By the 1700s, France was Europe's richest and most populous country, home to Europe's most spectacular palace. And that palace was Versailles, the palace other palaces were modeled after. The one many tried to outdo, but none succeeded. And the palace, a potent mix of art and architecture, is all about this man, the ultimate divine monarch, Louis XIV. It's said that Louis spent half of France's entire annual GNP to turn his dad's hunting lodge into a palace suitable for Europe's King of Kings. It's essentially a long series of lavish rooms, each with its own theme. Louis, portrayed with his capable hand on the rudder of state, was creating Europe's first modern centralized government. Throughout Europe, when you said the king, you were referring to the French king, Louis XIV. He was symbolized by Apollo, the Greek god of the sun. Here, the artist shows Louis with his entire family, all depicted as gods on earth, clearly divinely ordained to rule the masses without question. Hmm. Art celebrated how pleasure ruled at Versailles. The main suppers, balls, and receptions were held in this room. The ceiling is like a sunroof opening up to heaven filled with action parallel to the action right here in Louis' court. The style is delightfully Baroque, a riot of exuberant figures. The Venus Room reminded everyone that love ruled at Versailles. Here, couples would cavort, blessed from above by the goddess of love. And as if to encourage the fun, Venus sends down a flowery garland to ensnare others in delicious amour. By the mid-1700s, Baroque had morphed into a style called Rococo. If Baroque was controlled exuberance, Rococo was uncontrolled exuberance. As if the divine monarchs and aristocrats needed ever more over-the-top art to flaunt their privileged status, their art became even fancier. Ultimately, with the focus more on the decoration than on the subject itself. 
Baroque's curved lines became Rococo's even curvier lines. Circles became ovals. Everything glowed with gilding and plenty of mirrors. Rococo was like Baroque that got shrunk in the wash. Lighter, frillier, and more delicate. In the decor of this royal palace, you can see how Rococo is even fancier than fancy Baroque. Rooms slathered with enormous wealth. Kilos of gold leaf. Lots of exotic Asian influence and eye-popping extravagance. The Rococo style was perfect for the new generation of rosy-cheeked aristocrats embracing their carefree lives of leisure as never before frolicking amid nature and indulging in every sensual pleasure. The lives of these elites were much like their art, decoration over substance. Across Europe, aristocrats played in their palaces and picnicked in their bucolic backyards, pleasure gardens that stretched to the horizon as if their divine right world would go on forever. But of course, it didn't, and their excesses led to the revolution Everything was subjected to the test of reason, and if it wasn't reasonable, people were made a foot taller at the top. We don't have time tonight to go into neoclassicism, but neoclassicism was the understandable uh, answer to all of that fluffy Baroque and Rococo. Now we're going to step into our final hour. That's the, the, the modern age, going from about 1850 until today. This was the toughest hour to get everything fit in into 60 minutes. Uh, and today we're just going to look at 10 or 12 minutes of that. But let's go now into the final bit of our sweep through the story of European art. The last roughly two centuries from the mid 1800s on have seen unprecedented change. Advances in technology, the march of democracy, as well as two horrific world wars. And the art reflecting this age has been as turbulent exciting and dynamic as the times. We'll start with art that gave voice to the struggles for freedom, and art that celebrated the Industrial Revolution. Then trace how dreamy romantics countered that by reveling in nature and legends. We'll follow the rapid evolution of styles, from sun-splashed Impressionism to sinuous Art Nouveau. We'll see art capturing the horror of war, how art mirrored wild times, celebrated Europe's modern dynamism, and reflects our ever-changing world. Some yeah, I love this modern age, and we're going to get right into it now. And I, I do want to remember, remind you that in the late 1800s, Romanticism, which we were just talking about there, and nationalism went hand in hand. We did a whole one-hour symphony celebrating that called Symphonic Journey that you can watch anytime on our website. But right now, I like to excerpt from our show this little sweep where we look at how Romanticism and Romantic artists celebrate nationalism in Germany, Scotland, Norway, and Italy, all in the same generation, the late 1800s. And a little travel tip for you as you watch this, I really like when I'm in the capital of a country to go to its national gallery and look at art that celebrates its beautiful nature and its folk traditions before I venture out into the fjord country of Norway or the highlands of Scotland and I get a dose of the actual nature. Go to the museum first and you'll see the art like this and then you get a little sense of how the culture is so interwoven with its beautiful, beautiful nature. The strongest passions of the 19th century were stoked by the struggles of ethnic groups rising up to form their own nations. Romantic artists had a natural affinity for these patriotic underdogs, and galleries were filled with art that cheered on freedom. In Germany, still little more than a patchwork of medieval dukedoms, patriots began imagining a united country. By embracing their common German roots, the dreamy medieval legends, heroes fighting for the fatherland, Artists stoked idealistic dreams of a glorious German-speaking future. In Scotland, as patriots chafed at English rule, artists celebrated its independent spirit with a romanticized blend of myth and history. 
proud warriors sport clan regalia as if emboldened by kilts and plaid. In spite of tragic losses, a downtrodden yet resilient nation survived. Spirit intact. In Norway, salt of the earth locals reveled in their Norwegianness, celebrating traditional dress, heading for a country wedding, while engulfed in the majesty of the fjords. And in Italy, patriots united passionately behind dynamic leaders against their foreign oppressors. All across Europe, art illustrated how the modern forces of social progress battled old values as Europeans demanded freedom. In England, around 1850, the energy of Romanticism was channeled by a spirited brotherhood of artists, turning away from the frenzy of the Industrial Age and inspired by the dreamy medieval world before the great Renaissance painter Raphael, they called themselves the Pre-Raphaelites. The Pre-Raphaelites reveled in medieval damsels, mythical goddesses, and legendary lovers, all immersed in the fertile serenity of nature, captured in radiant colors and luminous clarity. They created melancholy visions of pure beauty. In this quintessential Pre-Raphaelite masterpiece, tragic Ophelia, who's fallen while picking a garland of wildflowers, is singing before she drowns. Her body, open and skyward, is somewhere between saintly and sensual, and the nature engulfing her is so fertile while decaying at the same time. So pale in contrast to the richness of nature, she had finally found happiness on the verge of death. Dreamlike beauty, medieval themes, the wonder of nature, these elements of the Romantic style also came together all across Europe in fairy tale castles. Built during the same generation, fanciful architectural dreams like these capped hills from Portugal to Romania to the foothills of Bavaria's Alps. Neuschwanstein, which looks medieval, was built only in the late 1800s. When Bavaria's King Ludwig wanted an escape from the grinding reality of governing, he found it here. Ludwig, a romantics romantic, had grown up in this castle. From his bedroom chair, reading medieval legends while surrounded by the grandeur of nature, he dreamed up the ultimate castle. And just up the hill, he built it. His medieval fantasy was completely modern with all the comforts of the 1870s. It sits on a hilltop, not for defensive reasons, but because the king liked the view. So there we see another one of these indications. Locations and art are listed at ricksteves.com. And this is something that was very um, frustrating for me. I wanted to give all the practical ideas about sightseeing and traveling and how, to, how you can go here. Uh, but we wanted to also keep the show focused and, and, and clean. So I'm happy that we can uh, send people to the website and then they can go into the TV section and they can look at the script and there they will find the details of, for instance, the castles we've just been talking about. Ludwig slathered the interior with misty medieval themes taken from operas written by his friend, the romantic composer, Richard Wagner. The Golden Throne Room saintly kings, and crown-shaped chandelier placed Ludwig among the great kings of old. With its natural setting, exotic decor, and joyous spirit of freedom, Ludwig's castle is a virtual theme park of romanticism. These artists were known as the Impressionists. Freed from the stifling constraints of the academy and inspired by the realists, they took their easels outdoors. Their philosophy, like a declaration of independence, it was out of the studio and into nature. The Impressionists painted the French countryside, but the true subject wasn't so much the farms, rivers, and forests. It was all about the light. 
They even studied which pigments would reproduce reflected light most accurately. And when the light was just right, they painted furiously to catch the scene before it was gone. The way the light reflected off the passing clouds, the waving grass, the billowing dress. The father of Impressionism was Claude Monet, the son of a grocer with little formal education. He dedicated his life to discovering new ways of seeing things. With this quick impression of a harbor at sunrise, Monet helped give the movement its name. The real subject, the impression of the light reflected on the water, rendered in a few squiggly lines or broad strokes of paint. Impressionists used an innovative technique. They applied bright colors in thick dabs side by side on the canvas and let them mix as they traveled to your eye. Up close, it's a mess, but move back and voila! Since the colors never completely resolve, they continued to vibrate in the mind, giving Impressionist paintings their shimmering vitality. Impressionism reached its culmination with the same man who started it, Claude Monet. Late in life, Monet moved to this garden estate. The colorful gardens were like his brushstrokes, a bit slapdash, but part of a carefully composed mosaic. Monet made a pond and filled it with water lilies. He painted the water lilies in this ensemble of canvases, all focusing on the ever-changing light from the pre-dawn darkness to clear morning light to afternoon lavender to golden sunset. He'd start by laying down thick, big brush strokes of a single color, horizontal and vertical, to create a dense mesh of foliage. Then add more color for the dramatic highlights until he got a dense paste of piled up paint. Up close, it's messy, but back up and the colors resolve into a luminous scene, just pure reflected color. The true subject is not really the lilies, but the changing reflections on the pond, where lilies mingle with the clouds and trees. Monet cropped his scenes ever closer, until there was no shoreline, no horizon, no sense of what's up or down until you're completely immersed. In his final paintings, the great Impressionist dissolved the physical subject more and more into purely abstract patterns of colorful paint, anticipating the future of art. Hmm. Wow, what a delight to be able to share Impressionism and the genius of those guys. Now, this is the last scene of the whole series. We're in Oslo at Frogner Park. Very special place to me because when I was a 14-year-old kid, this is where I had my eureka when I saw other parents loving their kids as much as my parents loved me all together in this park. It occurred to me, whoa, this world is home to billions of, of equally precious little children of God. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all in this together and we can reach out and travel and get to know each other. That was a beautiful moment for me. And I'm so thankful to be able to finish this celebration of art with a visit to Oslo's Biglund Gardens. This public park in Oslo, a lovely place to end our journey through Europe's art, lets us feel the pulse of Europe today. People go about their everyday lives amid the wonders of nature while enjoying art that celebrates the stages of human life, from birth to love to death. Its centerpiece is a tangle of figures that rocket skyward. Art connects us with our past and points the way forward. Like these timeless figures, we're all in this together, spiraling upward and onward toward who knows. It's the forever unfolding story of our lives, the mystery that finds expression in art. Art is oxygen for the creative spirit, a form of human expression that goes back to the beginnings of civilization itself. I'm Rick Steves. Thanks for celebrating with us the art of Europe. 
And thanks for celebrating with me right here on Monday Night Travel, a little greatest hit sweep through the story. I hope it's inspired you to want to check out the actual shows. It was heartbreaking to rip those shows down and just show these little segments, but it was a joy to be able to put it into an easy sort of access hour or so of video cuts so you can understand the fun that we've got to offer through this new series on public television, Rick Steves, Art of Europe. Hey, Ben, we were going to do a, a little um, flash poll or whatever you call it, right? Absolutely, Rick. Let's do it. We'll see what kind of response we get. So the question is, which era of art from the six that you've so beautifully taken us through here uh, is your favorite? So we'll launch that poll. and We'll let people answer for a moment. In the meantime, Rick, why don't you tell us about the word from our sponsor for the evening. Sure, and that's fun. People can just tick whichever, let's just say you saw 10 minutes out of each of those six hours. Right now, which would you be most interested in seeing the entire hour if you had the time and we had the time to share it? How are we doing with that flash poll? Is it flashy and done? Oh, it is flashy, Rick, and it very exciting results. I'll share them with everyone here. So the big winner, Rick, Renaissance at 40%. Look at that. Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, Botticelli, Albert Durer, Hieronymus, Bosch. So much great Renaissance. Well, that's good. I'm glad because in two weeks, three weeks, on the 24th, October 24th, three weeks from today, we're going to be back with more art. And I'm joined by our co-author, Gene Openshop. And Gene is putting together a bunch of clips like you just saw, but different clips. And it's going to be how the Renaissance is a linchpin for all of this great art. And Gene is brilliant, and I'm excited to share that with you. So I want to remind you, coming up, coming up very soon, next week, we're going to the lakes in the Dolomites of Italy with Patricia Fannin Ovilio. I know her as Patricia Fannin, but uh, she apparently now has an Italian last name, Ovilio. And uh, two weeks from tonight, we're going to go to Stockholm with a mother-daughter crew of guides, Ilva and Gabriella. And Gabriella's Name is Ilva Dotter, reminding you that in Sweden, it's not John's son, it's Ilva Dotter. So Ilva and her daughter, Gabriella Ilva's daughter, will be here two weeks from now to give you more information about Stockholm. And then, as I mentioned, on October 24th, three weeks from tonight, I'm going to be back with Jean Openshaw, and we're going to celebrate more art, keying in on the Renaissance. Hey, that was a great Great uh, survey there, a flash poll, Ben. And it's interesting how Renaissance was number one and modern was number two. All indeed, right. Indeed. I'm not too surprised, but very oh. interesting nevertheless. Rick, we have some excellent viewer questions. You know, we'll start with uh, the fact I don't think you answered that poll, Rick. So, what is your favorite of the six eras? Oh, that is. Well, the challenge for us was to know where to draw the line, you know. And I got to say the one readjustment, the one adjust what I would make in drawing those lines, I think I would have tried to do ancient and Rome together in one hour and then had more time for the modern age. There was so much to talk about in the modern age and we, we go through it. It's an exhilarating hour, but we could have done two hours in the modern age. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much in the modern era, the last 150 years. Um, you know, Rick, we also had people who were wondering if you could have any piece of European art in your home, what would it be? If I could have any piece of European art in my home, I already have it. Can I show you? <laughs> I've got one. Oh, Gustav Klimt. And I've, I, I got this up from a woman who's a beautiful um, artist who, who, who quilted this or embroidered this or whatever it is. And she lives up in the San Juans. And this is the kiss. But if I could have Gustav Klimt's kiss I would hang it right here and I would have to lock my door when I go out because that would be quite something. But I, we, we talk about Gustav Klimt in the show because I got to decide what we talk about and I just love Gustav Klimt. So if I could have any piece of art, of course there's countless pieces of art you'd love, but it would be pretty cool to have Klimt. That's a great choice. Rick, you have two wonderful kids and you've taken them to Europe from a young age. How would you recommend instilling an appreciation for art in a young child? Oh, that's a very good question. 
Uh, instilling appreciation of culture in a young style as child is done. My parents who have the ability to do that, to take them to Europe. We took our kids out of school every April for the first eight or nine years of their schooling. And the teachers all agreed. It was more stimulating and more educational for them to be with engaged parents sightseeing around Europe. And then the kids realize this culture and this art and all these different ways of living is it really carbonates your whole life. So that's really important. And how to help kids understand and appreciate art is the same as how to help adults understand and appreciate art. Learn about it, make it real, understand who paid for it and why. That's what we tried to do in this show is take you back to, to the old days to think about up until Albert Dürer, only the very elites could afford art. And then Albert Dürer could do those engravings. And, you know, he did a woodcut and then he'd put it in the ink and he'd print and print and print and print and print. And you could hand out the Albert Dürer with his mono, with his initials on it. And you could have yourself an Albert Dürer and hang it on the wall. And it was mass produced and affordable. It's fun to, I like to inject the economics of art. How did Rubens make all those masterpieces? Well, we just saw it there. He did the sketch, his students did the big one, and he gave it the fury of the brush. And then they slide it out to the next patron. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to make art lively. And we try to do that in our tours. Uh, and we try to do it in our teaching, like in this show. Rick, do you have a favorite art museum in Europe? I was thinking about that a lot when we were filming in the art museums. And um, it occurs to me the greatest collections of paintings today are the places that had the most powerful ruler 300 years ago with the most vast empire. I mean, why would the greatest collection of painting arguably be in Madrid of all places? because the king of, of uh, Spain was the emperor and he controlled much of Europe back when the Netherlands were called what? The Spanish Netherlands. My favorite Bosch paintings, they should be up in Holland or in Belgium, but they're in Madrid at the Prado. I think the Prado, well, my two favorite galleries probably are the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, home of the Habsburgs, and the Prado uh, in Madrid. Uh, so those would be because their kings were really powerful a long time ago. Speaking of this era of conquest, Rick, looted antiquities is a major issue. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how museums might try to tackle this issue? Yeah, that's a very tough one. And, um, you know, if if they took your art, you'd say it should come back. Um, if If you took the art 200 years ago or 100 years ago and you think you paid for it or you conned them out of it, you gave them some few bucks and you took the art or you went excavating there and they said, okay, you can come in and excavate and you can just take your favorite piece home. Um, later, people say it should go back. I kind of want to stay out of that. I mean, the the ethical, politically correct thing is say all art should go back to its original places. But you could argue that all the great art from Byzantium that's in Venice and Italy right now would have been destroyed and melted down if it stayed in its homeland in Constantinople, Istanbul. So I'm thankful the Venetians looted it and it survives to this day. So uh, it's, it's a dicey issue, but of course there's a, Europeans were brutal col co colonialists and their emperors were, empires were just brutal oppression. And it was all about greed. It wasn't about, you know, saving souls or loving people or spreading your values. It was just about money and slaves and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there's some pretty bad stories. I, I know when we were filming in London, they decided not to call the um, the marbles from the Acropolis in Athens the Elgin marbles anymore because everybody associates Elgin marbles with British imperialism. So now they're called the Parthenon marbles, uh, but they still are the marbles the British looted from them when they had a chance to take those marbles back to London. And London told Athens, well, we've got it because there's no adequate place to store these cultural treasures in Athens. Uh, so Athens said, okay, we'll build an appropriate place to store them. And now Athens has a perfectly good place to store them in the Acropolis Museum. And they've got just gaps in the display where the Elgin marbles are in London and Athens said they should go back there. It's an interesting struggle between cultures that um, I think needs to be looked at and thought about. All right, Rick, we have time for just one more question and it comes from Barbara. Is it true, Rick? that you thought art history was the most boring class on roster in college. And uh, if that's true, what changed your opinion about learning about art in the context of time? 
I think Barbara must have read, uh, we have on our website, when you look into the TV section or the on the homepage, you'll see a, a, a tile for the art series and click there and you'll see on the landing page, we've got 24 questions that I posed and answered. And one of them talked about how I thought art was the most boring class you could take at the university, especially European art. And uh, what changed that was some very good professors and some very good travels and years of taking groups to these great sites and realizing how thankful people are when they get adequately turned on to it. In so many cases, Ben, the more you appreciate and understand about what you're looking at, the more enjoyable it is. I can't get you a discount on the ticket, but I can tell you, if you know what you're looking at, you're gonna enjoy it three times as much as the next person that didn't do any preparation. And this six hour series, that's what it's all about. That's our mission to equip and entertain and inform and educate and inspire Americans to travel in a way that they get more out of that investment of time and money. And that's why I'm really in a good mood because we've been working on this a long time. We've spent a lot of money putting this together. And now it's airing all over the country. It's airing here in Seattle every Monday night at 10 and every Tuesday night at seven prime time. And it's airing in every city in the country sooner or later, some of them right now, some of them later, and you can stream it any old time on Passport, on PBS, and every week when the new one comes out, it'll be available right here at ricksteves.com. Hey, Ben, thanks for moderating. Thank all of you for showing up and helping us celebrate the advent of our six-hour miniseries, Rick Steves, Art of Europe. And we'll see you next week for more of Monday Night Travel. Happy travels. Good night, Ben. Good night, Rick. Good night, Julianne. Good night, Ben. Good night, Rick. <laughs>